Oh, and I'm hearing a bird chirping. And there we go. Bam, just like that. The bird chirped. And boom, we're all set. Very exciting. Good morning, everyone. A little later than normal, but that's okay. We've got flexibility because we've got so many great things happening. Great speaker today. But first, good morning, everyone. It is Wealth Wellness Wednesday. Carol Sue, aka Naughty Boss, Lady Can Alive with two. Sisters, hey, good morning, everyone. My name is Janice, aka Wellness Diva 3.0. Love that. Have to put that in there. You know, today on Wealth Wellness Wednesday, we have an amazing guest. And before we really do the introduction, we had a great conversation with Paul last week. And normally when we started up the guest pro, we call it the guest project because we want to showcase amazing guests in our field. We, we already had our lineup for this week and we said, we've got to have this guy on today. Wealth Wellness Wednesday. So without further ado, I would love to welcome our guest, Paul. Welcome to the Two Sisters podcast. I'm honored to be here with you guys. I'm excited to talk to you guys and uh, share my story. We're, we're super blessed. We're super honored. And, you know, we always, we, we chat about wealth, wellness Wednesday. Normally it's just chatting about having a great relationship with money and how uh, that really does affect our overall wellness. But we decided to change it up a little bit. We still keep with our theme. So don't you listeners and our audience, don't forget, pay it forward, pay that monetary game forward to someone, because when you put it out in the universe, good things are always get back to you. But when you have an impactful speaker like Paul is, and we're gonna have you share your story, uh, it is amazing because you cannot understand the impact of how someone's story will impact you until you actually hear it. So with that, Paul, tell us a little bit about, tell our viewers and listeners a little bit of, a little bit of background about yourself and kind of where you're at today. And we're gonna interject when we know the passion's gonna arise us. Okay, excellent. <clears throat> Okay, well, I was, I was born with something called cerebral palsy. And if your viewers don't know what that is, it happens at birth, at labor. It's lack of oxygen to the brain. And as a result of the lack of, lack of oxygen to the brain, it could leave one side of the body paralyzed. So when I was an infant, uh, I was not moving the right side of my body. And my mom was concerned that I wasn't moving the right side of my body. So she took me to the doctors to get me tested to see what was going on with me. And it was sure enough diagnosed that I had cerebral palsy and the doctors thought it was so severe that I would not be able to walk, that I need to get used to being in a wheelchair. Well, thank goodness for a wonderful mom. She didn't go with that diagnosis. She got a second, third, fourth, fifth, finally found a physician that was willing to help, help me. And that's really when my intense journey of physical therapy started. And I got my first big feet I was able to walk at three. I was able to defy the doctor. I was able to walk, which was a wonderful, wonderful thing. I don't really remember that um, because just I was three. I just don't remember. But I do remember being put into soccer when I was five. And at the time, I could only run about 25 to 50 yards while these other kids are running laps around the soccer field. And I thought, man, this is ridiculous. I'm making a fool out of myself. All I can do is run to the lamppost and back, and these kids are running laps all around me. So I went, I went to my mom and I said, hey, I don't, I don't want to play soccer anymore. I'm, I'm making a fool out of myself. And my mom said, that's okay. You don't have to play soccer anymore, but we need to honor our commitment. So you need to finish out the season. And then if you don't want to play soccer after that, then that's your prerogative. You don't have to play soccer anymore. That's exactly what happened. I finished out the season. I've never played soccer ever again in my life. Um, then I got a, a second big break, I got, uh, right around six. I got surgery on my right foot to tighten up the tendons, <clears throat> give me a little bit more spring in my step, and take away the pain when I was feeling when I ran. And I didn't test it out yet, but I changed schools right around that same time. And I'll never forget this. The first day of PE, physical education, we did our stretches, and the teacher said, okay, now run a lap. And I'm thinking to myself, here we go again. I'm going to run 25 to 50 yards, and the, these kids are going to see that, and they're going to start teasing me because I'm going to stand out. But things were different because of my operation. I was able to go past that point where I normally have to stop, and I remember keeping up with the other kids. And in my head, I was like, come on, Paul. You got this, buddy. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. And I finished the lap with the other kids. On the outside, I kept it cool, but on the inside, I was like, 
yes, yes, yes. Finally, the first time in my life, I just fit in. I didn't stand out like the other kids with like the other kids. And things did get easier for me, but I wouldn't consider them easy. I switched schools again in junior high. And as you guys know, junior high is a tough, tough age. So just being a new kid alone is tough. But I was a new kid with a disability. So I came in, they're bullying, teasing me pretty much every single day. And on top of this, <clears throat> I was raised Catholic, so my mom wanted me to go to a Catholic high school. So I had to take an assessment test to see where I was at academically so they could see where they wanted to place me. Well, I must have bombed the thing because when I met with the principal, they said they were going to put me, she said she's going to put me in the lowest level and I don't see college material out of Paul. So don't expect much from them. So I had that against me. I'm being bullied and teased in school. I, I'm, I'm laying in bed, crying myself to sleep. My two big emotions were anger and sadness. And midway through eighth grade, I was sick of feeling angry and sad because that was my go-to emotions. And deep down, those are not my go-to emotions, but they were just because of the environment I was in. And I didn't want to feel that way anymore. So I said to myself, what can I do to distract me from feeling anger and sadness all the time? And at the time, I loved baseball. So I thought to myself, what if I tried to make my varsity baseball team? So I so I enrolled in fall ball, winter ball, spring ball. If I wasn't doing that, I was throwing a tennis ball against the wall. And I was doing this over and over again. And the beautiful thing about this goal that I set for myself, I didn't know this at the time. Now I know looking back, I was changing the energy I was putting out to these other kids, meaning I had my shoulders back, my head forward. And as a result of this energy change that I was putting out to the world, I was getting a different energy back to me. In other words, these kids, instead of bullying and teasing me, they started rooting for me. And so my high school career was much, much different from my junior high career, all because of the energy shift that I did. And I'm happy to say that I did make my varsity baseball team as a junior and a senior. And then I graduated high school. My baseball career was pretty much done at this time. <clears throat> and I really start to think about what that principal said to me a few years earlier about me not being college material. And I, I started to think about the goal I set for myself of making a, a, a baseball team with cerebral halls. And at the time, that was probably an impossible feat that I, that I was going after, but I was able to accomplish that. And so I thought to myself, why not set another goal to say that you are college material? So I enrolled in a junior college, took that 2.0 to a 3.5, transferred to Cal State Fullerton, uh, graduated from there. And I so wanted to go back to that principal and say, see, see, I was college material. But I thought to myself, you know what? I should probably thank her because what if I wouldn't have had that motivation to go hit it as hard as I did? Because at the time, I mean, I, I was going to I, was, I had a tutor. I was going to the math lab. I was doing all kinds of stuff just to just to get, you know, these good grades. I don't know how hard I would hit it if I didn't have that motivation of that principal in the back of my head saying that I, I wasn't college material. So in the end, I should thank her. So now I graduated, I have no life experience. I have no idea what the heck I wanna do with myself. Um, I had a family friend who was a CEO of a, of a small bank and he said, why don't you try becoming a mortgage loan officer? And I said, yeah, why not? Let's give it a shot. I got nothing else I'm doing right now. So <clears throat> I get hired there and I quickly realized that nobody wanted to talk to me. Everybody was kind of shunning me. And the reason why everybody was shunning me was because they knew that I got, I knew the CEO of the, of the bank and they thought that I got the job because of my name and not my talents. Well, I mean, that was partially true. I, I, I did get the job because of who I knew, but they didn't know my talents at the time. And I remember sitting at the lunch table and nobody wanting to sit next to me. And I'm thinking to myself, wow, this puts me back to my junior high days. And I thought, well, let's go back to that in my head. I go, what did I do? I said, I set that goal about uh, wanting to make my varsity baseball team. What attributes can I transfer over that would help me in this situation? And I thought to myself, well, when I, when I went for baseball, I put my head down, I worked hard, I had a good attitude and I did what I needed to do. So that's what I did here. I put my head down. If somebody asked me to do something, I did it in a timely manner. I always had a positive attitude. And from afar, I was, watching what the top producer loan officers would do. Um, they wouldn't talk to me, so I just would observe them from afar. And I remember when it was time for me to go out in the field and get loans, I, uh, the, the, my family friend, the CEO, stopped me and go, what are you doing? I go, I'm ready. I think I'm ready to go out and you know go out in the field and get some loans. And he's like, 
with a concerned look, eh, Junior, you're, you're not ready yet. We, we need to get you a little bit more training. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 I got this. So I, I went out there, and let me tell you something. I fell on my face M- months after months after months. You know, the clients were just beating me up. They weren't giving me any loans. And then I started to realize what value could I add to these clients? And once I started to realize what value I could add, things started to come into place and I started to get loans slowly but surely. And then two years later, I became a top producer. And all the, a lot of the people that didn't even want to talk to me now were talking to me, asking me for advice. So it was such a shift. And for, for the longest time, I just enjoyed the industry. Uh, then 2008, 2009 hit and the economy just changed and they put these new rules and regulations on us and it really made our job a little bit tougher to do. And I started to lose the luster of, of the industry. So this changed my life. They brought in this motivational speaker, came to talk to our sales team to pump up the numbers and the guy blew me away. The guy was awesome. So I made a point to go and talk to him after and tell him how great of a job he did. And he was so gracious. Uh, he allowed me to pick his brain. And he told me he started as a life coach. I'm like, a life coach? What the heck is a life coach? And he explains that to me. And I'm like, you know what? Maybe that's what I want to do. So on my off time, I was taking courses to get my coaching certificate. And I started to tell people, hey, I, I want to become a life coach. And and a lot of my, the mortgage uh, people were telling me, oh, okay, whatever, humoring humor me. Okay, yeah, go, a life coach, go ahead and get loans, you know, whatever. <clears throat> then it really started to get serious. I started to get my website up. I, I, I started to start my business. And the bank that I was working with at the time looked at this and goes, well, this is a conflict of interest. And they came up with like a two-page list of uh, restrictions that I could and couldn't do. And I realized real quickly that I'm not going to get any tractions in the coaching industry with all these restrictions. So uh, I made the decision that I'm going to have to make a leap of faith, that I'm going to have to go at this full force. So I, I, I made some financial changes. I paid off a lot of my debts. I changed my spending habits. And then, then I, I made the leap of faith and quit the mortgage industry. And I have to tell you, a lot of people at that time were really uh, surprised and kind of taken back that I, that I, that I did this, like, you're going to fall on your face. You're a mortgage loan officer. You're not, you're not a coach. What are you doing? And I'm like, I want to go for this. I want to try this. And I go, okay. And for the longest time, my relationships with these people that I've had great relationships for 10 years, they barely were talking to me all because of all, all because I wanted to be a life coach. It was, it was kind of an odd, odd thing. So, so I got into it and I was, Nobody wanted to trust me. This was hard, really, really, really hard. And uh, and I was starting to doubt myself. I go, maybe I should just go back to the mortgage industry. Maybe, I, maybe they are right. Maybe I'm not a life coach. And I thought to myself again, what value could I add to these clients? And I thought to myself of my own story about cerebral palsy. For the longest time, the story that I told you guys I was embarrassed by that story. I was ashamed of that story. And if I did tell any of this story, I'd probably be in tears. I'd be so emotional about it. And the reason why I was so emotional about it is because all my life, all I wanted to do through childhood was just fit in. I didn't want any special treatment. I didn't want to stand out. I, I always had that mantra. I could do it. God, you know, don't give me special treatment. I, I'm just like you. I can do it. So I wanted to bury that story about cerebral palsy. But I thought to myself, with clients, I go, how are they going to be vulnerable with me if I'm not vulnerable with them? I need to, they need to know where I'm coming from. I need, to, I need to tell them my story. And once I started doing that, once I started sharing my story, things started opening up for me. People started to trust me. They're like, okay, this, this guy, he knows where I'm coming from because he's gone through the struggle. And, uh, you know, so that people started to hire me and I did right by the clients and, they, and the word of mouth and it keep snowballing, snowballing. And then I started doing a podcast to help people. And through my podcast, my coaching program, I'm happy to say we're helping thousands of thousands of people. And I'm here talking with you guys. I mean, you know, you, you, first off, kudos, I have to say this before it's because I, twirling in my, my brain, kudos to your mom um, because she taught you a lesson that sadly is not taught and is lost in parenting style today. And that is, value your commitment when you and i hear too many stories of so many moms and dads alike 
oh, you know, Johnny, you know, started out, he was all excited, but you know, he's not really feeling it. So we're just going to pull him out. And I remember with my own children, getting them involved with different sports, soccer, cheerleading and whatnot. And we always said that, we always said that if you make a commitment, you have to see it through. It doesn't mean that you have to do it forever, but other people are counting on you. But most of all, you need to be able to count on yourself to be, be authentic. And if you give up on yourself, just because oh, you're not really sure if it's the right thing for you, you might be surprised a blessing may come down the road. So kudos to your mom for instilling that. And I really truly believe through that journey, that lesson stayed with you because it really showed you, you know, hey, it, it kind of would bring you back to different situations, but you kind of like, I'm gonna see this through. Like you saw, you know, your, your junior high, even though you're right, those are really, your junior, your junior year is probably, you know, elementary, junior high years are, are really an awkward time because you're like a tweener, you're in between, you know, being that high school cool kid uh, and really trying to fit in. But sometimes that overflow also kind of stays with you through high school years. And I think the other key piece to that was even though the Catholic school did not did not maybe say the, the right thing or had the faith uh, that your mom and that you had, that's part of the journey. And it's the, that her harsh words or harsh statement were really paramount that stayed with you consciously and subconsciously to get you through, to go back to, you could always go back to that moment to say, hey, I proved them wrong. I was authentically me, yeah. I had a divot and pivot in the way that maybe I necessarily did something, but at the end of the day, I stuck to my guns and I, and I fulfilled my commitment. And I think that basis, kudos to your mom and kudos to all the parents out there that hear this, know that what we teach our children and it's a small lesson, that lesson carried you throughout your whole, your, your whole school years, college certificate, journey with your profession and now look where you are today don't you think jan i mean how crazy is that it is and i just want to point out and i think we may have said this when we chatted last week there's always a story behind the story and that is so important because it's personal but it's very poignant in the sense that that is going to inspire somebody across the world who may take action in their own lives and being raw and real when you are in that situation I think I, I don't know what I would have do but you you had mentioned something about um, after you had graduated from college and you wanted to go back to that principal I think she's watching you now and I don't know this person, but I'm feeling the energy and I'm saying, and I'm thinking, feeling that, wow, look what this, look what Paul achieved, despite somebody in my position saying otherwise. And not only that, your disability alone, let, let's, let's get to that piece to it, you know, to, you know, the, the disability occurred at birth. So you don't know any different. You don't know, I mean, other than obviously the obvious things that probably occur, even if you didn't have a disability, that awkwardness, the kind of the bullying at school, you know, if you're not the popular kid, that happens to everybody at some time or another. Yeah, there probably are some that kind of skirt around it. But for, I would say for the most part, people have embraced it one time or another unbeknownst or beknownst to them. But in your case, you were born with a disability. So you didn't know any different, except that you still wanted to feel accepted and you didn't want the disability to showcase of what you can do. And you did not allow the disability to define you, to define what you, the possibilities of what you visioned for success and how you want to impact people. So I think when you look at it from the whole perspective, the disability in its own way, as hard as it is, is a blessing and a gift. Oh yeah, most definitely it is because I think that my coaching career 
has been built on it is bit and built on my story having the cerebral palsy so i i've turned my uh disability into an advantage because i i can share the story and, and because of the story that i have people feel comfortable sharing their struggles with me because they know in their back of their head that this guy knows he he went through that struggle he'll he'll understand where i'm coming from so yeah it definitely has become an advantage uh uh because I've shared my story, because I've embraced vulnerability. I, I think that, you know, growing up, I always thought vulnerability was a weakness. But now I understand vulnerability is a strength. Absolutely. Well, now, what would you, what would you, you know, we've got listeners, we've got uh, viewers watching today. What would be if the one thing that you would say to them, hey, you know, if you know somebody that has a disability, or if you are experiencing that yourself, or if you have a family member, what would be the one thing that you would tell them as not only encouragement, but not to give up on themselves? I think what I would tell people with disabilities, and I have clients that do have uh, disabilities, the, the, the main focus that I tell the, those clients and anybody who has a disability is this, Stop focusing on what you can't do and focusing on what you can do and find out what your passion is, what your talent is. And once you perfect that passion and talent, share it with the world to see because everybody has a unique talent that they can share with the world. We just got to find out what it is. And once we do, sky is the limit. I, I love that because I always say, and, and, and that's one of the lines that we always use, mm -hmm. But what I love about that is, let's be real, if we were all exactly the same, the world would be boring. We would be boring. So the fact that we all have talents and gifts, you just got to hone in that, Jan. Don't you think that, you know, if you just focus in on what you love and transpire into something that's going to impact others, it's amazing. It is because, um, and I got chills when you said focus on what you can do not on what you can't do because that really has been a mantra of mine for so many years now and i do get the chills even when i think about it or if i'm writing in my journal or i'm writing um you know fine-tuning a book that my sister and i are co-authoring right now and it gives me the chills in so many different ways because that's really for me it's like a point of reference Oh, okay. Well, I can't kick the, the kickboxing bag like I used to, but I can do it, lift my leg up. I don't have to kick the bag. I mean, I'm just kind of using that a, a little bit there, you know, with, you know, with what happened with my foot, but it can be with anything going on in your life. And why not focus on what we can do? Because there's so much good in that that overrides the can't. Oh yeah, most definitely. I think that's, it all starts with our mindset and it all starts with self-love. Before we wanna accomplish any task whatsoever, we have to love ourselves first and foremost. We need to be able to look at ourselves in the mirror and go, I love you. And once you can do that and truly say that I love you, then the sky's the limit because then you'll have the confidence to go on and take on these tough tough tasks that we want to take on and yeah and, the, and one of the one things that you know you you frequently will hear is fake it till you make it it's one of the one lines i absolutely can not stand because i think part of the success or envision or going after that is being authentically you bumps and all and i don't think that you can truly embrace yourself and look in the mirror to say that you love you without accepting, hey, accept me, all my flaws, all my screw-ups, all my bumps. Those were little bruises I needed along the way to get me to that end goal. And guess what? When I get to that end goal, I'm going to move the goalpost because I'm going after something else. But don't worry about perfection. Don't worry about that you got to get it right the first time or be perfect at it. It's not supposed to be that way. True. And I think the other thing with that is if we can look at ourselves in the mirror and say, I love you. Okay, you're having a bad hair day, whatever. If that's the worst thing you have to complain about, who cares? But what is that going to do for you going forward? 
And I'm really curious to ask you this question. What is next on the horizon for you? I mean, you've built obviously an amazing business. You've captured us with your story uh, and obviously your clients that, that you coach. What do you think is next for you? Do you have something big planned? Yes, I want to really take on uh, a speaking career. I think that's my next goals. Uh, obviously, it kind of was put on the side because of uh, COVID-19, but you know, it seems like things are starting to open up. So I'm going to start to hit that hard and get out you know, at different events and really share my story because I feel like I, I, I feel, feel like it would be very impactful. And, I, and nothing is greater than doing a presentation. And after it's done, people clap. I just, the energy is so awesome. So, so that, that's my next goal is just getting out there and, and sharing my story in, in more of a speaking realm. I see you on a TEDx stage. That would be great. That's definitely a goal from, of mine. So thank you for that. You're welcome. You're welcome. And any books on the horizon for you? You know, uh, I, I've been thinking about it, but I think I, I want to push the journey a little bit further. Then, then I'll then I'll go into the book. Uh, it's really not on the on my forefront. Maybe down the road, but right now, the the speaking is where I want to focus my energy, and and obviously my clients. That is wonderful. Um, we're just really blown away here, and. The fact that you can um, still reach out to your clients. Obviously, everybody's been so affected by the um, the China virus pandemic, whatever, however we want to refer to it to. And I assume that you're holding all of your meetings, you know, via Zoom or, you know, have you have your clients adapted to that? Well, the beautiful thing about coaching is I coach people all over the United States even before COVID-19. So really wasn't that big of a transition because I was using Zoom before Zoom was cool, just because I, I felt like, you know, having that video conference and really seeing each other's expression, I think is very, very important. So uh, under that circumstances, it really, I really haven't had a transition on that. I was already doing that anyway. I was rarely ever meeting anybody face to face because some of my clients, you know, work you know, 50 hours a week and they don't have time to meet me somewhere, it's much easier for them just to fire up that laptop and then just go, okay, here we go. So I think that's how we've been going. So it's, it's been, it's been good. That is amazing. And where could someone reach out to you? This is, Hey, you know, he resonated with me. I, I just really think he could really impact my life. How would they reach out to you, Paul? Thank you for asking me that. Uh, the easiest way to uh, get in touch with me is through my website, a call to action .coach. Uh, I have my email on there. You can set up an appointment through the website. Or if you're old school, you can give me a call. I have my cell phone on there and we can set up an appointment that way. I always do a free consultation because I want to make sure that we're right fit for each other. Because I, I've had amazing conversations with a lot of people and sometimes we're just not a fit. I mean, they're great people. But I feel I work with other coaches and I go, you know what, your personality would work better with this type of coach. And, and this is the reason why I feel that way. And the reason why I do that is, is the focus on the client is because I, I feel like if I focus on the client and I do right by the client, the right client will come my way. The energy will come my, my way. And I, I firmly believe that. And the same with the other coaches that I work with. They're the same way. If they, if they feel like I'm a better fit, they'll, 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 they'll get in touch with me. So it's, it's a great community that we work on. And it's all about the clients, all about doing right by the client. If you do right by the client, everything else will come into place. And I love that because that's really being authentically you, but also uh, as the client, they truly appreciate that. Hey, you know, uh, we weren't a fit, but gosh, he gave me uh, an insight to somebody else that's really helped me. But geez, after I even had that conversation with Paul, I know someone that Paul will definitely impact. So it really is really showing being just human and humanity, passing it forward, being kind, paying it forward, and really making sure that whatever route or journey someone wants to go that it's always going to be uh, authentic 
And that is really, really important, especially in a coaching scenario. Uh, it's authenticity is paramount. And you really have to showcase that, Paul. We, I think our viewers and listeners will really appreciate that. I really, really appreciate those kind words. I thank you for that. You're welcome. You know, it's amazing to your, your story. And I've said this before, from where you started out to where you are now. And um, I just want to give a shout out again to your mom. Um, we think she's flipping amazing. And what a wonderful job she did raising you. Yeah, I have to give a shout out to her because without her, I'd be in a wheelchair right now. So she was my voice when I didn't have one. So there's not words I can express to the love I feel for her. Oh, how sweet. And that's so good to hear. And it's so good to, to celebrate those that are advocates in our life when we can't be an advocate for ourselves. And I think that in itself was a lesson and such a guiding tool for you throughout your life. And that's, that's amazing. Yeah, absolutely. Wow. It has been our pleasure to have you on today. And we hope that you'll consider coming on again. In fact, we'll be contacting you. We would love to have you on again and see where you are. You know, if you've gotten on that TEDx stage yet, you know, keep, please keep us and our viewers informed. On that note, my name is Janice, AKA, blah, blah, blah. rewind that a little bit, AKA Wellness Diva. Once again, thank you so much. And I am with two sisters. And I'm Carol Sue, a.k.a. Nani Boss, Lady Canna here live with Paul, with my two sister. And we are wishing you a happy, happy Wealth Wellness Wednesday. Remember, pay it forward. Be kind. Remember, you're not in the shoes of somebody else. Be, you know, be that nice person to them and put a smile on your face because you never know who you're going to impact. You guys have a great Wednesday and we will see you tomorrow. Hmm, what's trending on Trending Thursday? Find out with two sisters tomorrow. You guys take care. Have a great day. Have a great day, everyone. Bye-bye.